Well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad you could join us. Uh, my name is Sonia Bingaman, and I'm the Regional Manager of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, the Sacramento Regional Office. We cover the 10 counties, uh, including Sacramento, includes Yolo, Yuba, Sutter, Calusa, Placer, Nevada, Alpine, Sierra, and El Dorado counties. And we know many of you are from all over the state, so welcome. These issues are pertinent to everyone. And so um, other than a few little details that might be specific to Sacramento, we're glad that you could be here. We know we have folks from all the way down in San Diego and the Bay Area and the Central Valley. So thank you all for joining us. Um, this is our 22nd Zoom chat that we've had since COVID started. And we've just appreciated this opportunity to connect with the community and share information and have a lot of wonderful guest um, guests on our show um, to share information. Um, this month, we are focusing on employment. Uh, all four of our Tuesday Zoom chats were focused on employment. So this is the third one. And our final one is next week. Uh, talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So I'd like to thank Kathy for monitoring our chat. Kathy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Kathy Bryan, and I work in the Sacramento Regional Office of the State Council along with Sonia. And um, my role today will be uh, taking questions um, from the chat. So um, if you have anything you want to ask and you don't want to ask it out loud, Put it in the chat and I'll uh, be happy to share it with you. Thank you for joining. Good to see Thank you. you. Thank you. So the State Council on Developmental Disabilities is established by state and federal law as an independent state agency to ensure that people with developmental disabilities and their families receive the services and supports they need. Through advocacy, capacity building, and systemic change, SCDD works to achieve a consumer and family-based system of individualized supports, services, and other assistance. Throughout the training today, I'll launch several polls to get your input and also about how the training went. We are recording this session and it will be posted on YouTube within a few days. We will follow up with an email and share the link with you. We encourage you to share the link with others who missed the training today, especially with family members and self-advocates um, who would like to hear this information, but maybe are busy doing other things during the day. This month, we've been partnering with Alta California Regional Center to celebrate employment. This is the third in our four-week series focused on employment and celebrating national employment of people with developmental disabilities. Our first session on October 6th, and there are recordings of all of these sessions, so you can uh, visit them on YouTube. We focused on the regional center services that support employment, employment first legislation and competitive integrated employment, and Cindy Lee was our guest that day. On October 13th, we focused on the Department of Rehabilitation Services and Supports and Career Explor Exploration Services. Today, we're going to focus on outreach to businesses about hiring individuals and what the benefits are to their business. We'll also discuss wage issues and how they affect SSI and general benefits counseling, which is becoming more and more of an important topic. And next Tuesday on October 27th, we will have a panel of individuals, including a parent and job developers and job coaches and self-advocates share about the work experiences, challenges and successes and how they adapted their jobs during COVID. We hope you'll join us for the celebration and to support the individuals who are being brave enough to share their stories on Zoom. Please encourage self-advocates, family members, and others to join us for this special event. And again, we'll share out that flyer with you tomorrow. Now I'd like to turn the mic over to Cindy Lee, Employment Services Specialist with Alta California Regional Center. Cindy will be hosting the rest of today's training. Cindy, can you introduce yourself and say a little about Alta Regional Center as well? Sure. Thank you so much, Sonia, for um, the introduction. So again, my name is Cindy Lay. I am the Climate Employment Specialist at Alta California Regional Center. I am so excited to co collaborate with State Council on Developmental Disabilities to celebrate National Disability Awareness Month. As um, Sonia mentioned, this is the third of the four Zoom chat series that Alta is proud to collaborate with uh, State Council on. So to share a little bit about ALTA, uh, we are one of the 21 nonprofit regional centers in California. We cover the same geographical locations as um, state council, ranging from Sacramento to Calusa to Alpine and Sierra and all the counties in between. 
Uh, we serve individuals who are eligible for our services based on a development of disability, such as intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and autism. We also serve individuals with other substantially disabling conditions closely related to intellectual disability or which requires treatment similar to the treatment required by persons with an intellectual disability. So my role as the client employment specialist at ALTA is development, monitoring, and quality assurance for employment programs. Um, I also implement the paid internship program and also the competitive integrated um, employment incentives program. Um, I started with the region about 15 years ago, 10 years at Valley Mountain Regional Center, and um, five years at Alta. So with this, I would like to go ahead and um, introduce you to Steve Ruder, who is the chairperson for the Business Advisory Council, which Alta has the honor to partner, partner with. Um, right now, I would like to go ahead and pass the mic over to Steve to introduce himself. Then we will continue a chat discussions about the uh, Business Advisory um, Committee. Um, and again, if you have any questions for Steve, feel free to drop them in the chat and Kathy will help to monitor and address them accordingly. Steve? Thank you, Cindy. Um, so as, as Cindy said, my name is Steve Ruder. I work at Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities at the UC Davis Mine Institute. Uh, there are three UCEDs throughout California. There's one at USC, the one at UCLA, and the only one in Northern California is at UC Davis. Um, I came to the Mine Institute um, and UC Davis uh, seven years ago. Uh, my background for throughout my career, I was a direct service staff until working at UC Davis. Um, I um, started all the way back in 1980, uh, working at, at a developmental center uh, uh, moved on to do, actually in 1985, I started and supported employment when it was really a very, very beginning, um, you know, a way of, of supporting people with disabilities. Um, worked at Training Towards Self-Reliance. I saw one of the people uh, on, on here uh, was from TTSR. Um, and, uh, and then came back uh, into supported employment um, and, and eventually, again, transferred over to the, the UC Davis Mine Institute. Um, so that's a little bit about me and my background. Okay, well, thank you so much, Steve. Can you please tell us a little about, a little about the, what the BAC is and its vision, mission, and background? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so the Business Advisory Council is, uh, we are not the originators of the idea of a BAC. Um, business advisory councils uh, exist in almost every area that has a transition program. Uh, I believe it's actually a requirement of transition programs to have a business advisory council. What makes ours different is that um, as compared to being a transition project uh, within, within high school, is we actually have a business advisory council that is focused on adult services. And we started in uh, 2000, uh, 2015, uh, so we've only been around for, for five years. Um, but we have done 14 events for businesses. We just did our last one last week. Um, and the basic idea of a Business Advisory Council is to, first of all, um, bring the, the agencies that do supported employment together, and that ranges from regional center supported employment agencies, Department of Rehabilitation, uh, the American Job Centers. And we work to, first of all, share resources and best practices amongst the, the team of, business, of, of supported employment agencies. And then we plan events that, is, that are really for the business of, uh, community. And, and the events are really focused on uh, how they can uh, begin to work with our, the agencies that, that make up the Business Advisory Council, why businesses would benefit from taking advantage of those services, and, and really many mis businesses that want to do this oftentimes don't know, how do I make that connection? And so it really, we are 
a way for businesses, a central place that they can connect with, and then we will help them connect with our partner agencies, um, depending on their needs. I see. So who are the members of the BAC? So the, the members of the BAC, again, there's really two different ways to think about that. There's the supported employment and workforce development agencies. Again, all of our regional center supported employment agencies, the Department of Rehabilitation and the American Job Centers. And so that's one element of who makes up the BAC. But then the, the second part are the businesses that have worked with our, our, our partners. And so, you know, in the years that we've been doing this, uh, we have featured businesses ranging from very small businesses. Uh, one that was a owner operated business that uh, in the very first person she hired was a person who had autism. All the way up to very large corporations that, that we've worked with. Um, and so, so what we're trying to do is not just feature those businesses that have partnered with us, but to have an opportunity for those businesses to share their experiences with new businesses that our agencies have yet to actually um, create a, a partnership with. And so it's really there to help new businesses learn about from a business partner. I see. So how does the BAC help businesses expand their workforce to hire people with disabilities? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question because the, for many businesses, um, you know, it depends on the, on, on the size. A small business is usually looking to increase efficiency. If you really need to bring in someone the core people in that business can kind of focus on what, you know, what they're working on. Um, for a large business, it's oftentimes is increasing efficiency or taking care of, of things that other departments have, have not been able to get to. But it, there's the other layer for a large business. Many of them really do have a core focus on having a diverse a diversity and that may be because that's a, that is a, um, because that's a value of the business, but there are other businesses that actually have a requirement to meet a, a, a diverse workforce. And so part of what we are doing is making sure that disability is part of diversity. And even amongst the disability within diversity, is making sure that developmental disabilities are included within that. Because I'll be honest, many, the diversity is typically looked at in, in terms of, of, of the general diversity that you think of, in terms of making sure that you have people you know, from different walks of life. But disability part of diversity is oftentimes overlooked. And even within that, the, the, I think for many people, the last group of people that they imagine as being part of a disability diversity workforce is people with developmental disabilities. So it's really making sure that we highlight that people with developmental disabilities have very valuable work, uh, work skills um, and, and, and that they can do a very, a much wider range of work than many businesses imagine they can. Wow, I see. That is very interesting. You know what, Steve, let's pause there for a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and let Sonia launch a poll question and then we will continue with our chat. Is that okay? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. So I've launched a poll that says, the question is, what are the benefits to a business to hire a person with a disability? And you can select as many as you want. Um, at least that's how it should be. Has anyone tried to uh, answer yet? Because <laughs> I'm, okay, there we go. Um, so the first option is tax incentives for the business. So this would be a benefit to the business. Hiring an employee who is eager to work and learn new skills have the assistance and support of a job coach and on the job training 
or accessing the paid internship program through the regional center to pay the first $10,700 in wages, or desire to carve out a job function from other employees to create a new position and let other employees focus on other tasks that they have, or desire to, learn to lower turnover and increase morale, or desire to develop a more diverse workforce, or all of the above. And you can select any of them plus all of the above if you want. So we'll give it another couple of seconds. Half of you have filled it if, in. If I can I just mention. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. If I can just mention, the one thing I appreciate about this is that you, you titled it the business poll as compared to an employer poll. Mm -hmm. And one of the very first things that the Business Advisory Council focused on with the, the agencies that we partner with is to stop referring to businesses as employers, because that's not what they're there for. They're not mm -hmm. there to employ people. They're there to do a business function. So I mm -hmm. appreciate that this is titled a business poll rather than employer poll. Okay, we're going to go ahead and end the poll and I will share the results. Turning it back over to you, Cindy. Okay, wow, this is amazing. So we have um, for the first um, answer, which includes tax incentives for the business, 48% of you have chosen that. Um, hiring an employee who is eager to work and learn new skills, 40%. Have the assistance and support of a job coach and on the job training, 44%. Accessing the paid internship program to the first, um, it should be 10,400 in wages, that's 32%. Um, the desire to carve out job functions from other employees to create a new position and let other employees focus on other tasks, that has a 32% vote. Um, desire to lower turnover and increase morale, that's 32%. Desire to develop a more diverse workforce has 36% of the vote, and all of the above has the most, which is 76%. So all very good questions. So thank you before, so much. Before we, we get, before we get rid of this on the screen, I would like to just uh, mention one thing. And that is Sonia, that- you, I'm sorry, Steve. Sonia, can you put that back on? I accidentally closed it out. Oh, did you? Okay. I, uh, I can't, yes, you can't because that's fine. it'll zero it out. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, it's that, on my screen. Yeah, because you're a co-host. Okay, yeah. so the one thing, I, the, the, the only thing I wanted to mention is that uh, the, the first one, the tax incentive for businesses came out to be polled as one of the highest outside of all of the above. And, and in our experience, many businesses um, who, uh, when we've introduced the idea of a tax, uh, the tax break that, that they can get, very few businesses actually follow through with that. Mm -hmm. break. Um, and so uh, I, for anyone who's a service provider, who's approaching businesses as that being the leading, a kind of your leading uh, edge of, of why someone should be hired, I would encourage you to rethink that because in fact, very few businesses uh, find that tax break to be uh, lucrative enough and simple enough to actually use. Um, very few businesses that we've introduced to actually have gone through with it, or if they started that they use it for very long. Right, right. And I totally agree with that, even based on my conversations with some of the businesses that, you know, have reached out to inquire about the paid internship program. You know, the tax incentive was um, rarely a topic of discussion as to why they're interested in hiring someone with a, a disability. You know, the number one um, top answer has always been to increase diversity amongst their uh, workforce. So thank and you again, so much for that. That's probably a, a very common response from a large business. Small mm -hmm. business, that's rarely the first thing. It's usually more the efficiency in a small business. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, can you talk a little bit about the supports that the BAC offers to the businesses? Well, this is where things get, you know, um, I, I, I'm always cautious about appearing to claim credit for the work that our partner agencies do. So, the supports that the Business Advisory Council provide is primarily 
for the businesses to learn about our partner agencies. That's really the to learn about and partner with our or with, with our agencies that that are members of the Business Advisory Council. Um, as I said, businesses are you know it's it's to run a successful business is an extreme challenge, and businesses rarely have the time to learn about what's the advantage of partnering with an American Job Center or what's the advantage of, part, of, of partnering with the Department of Rehabilitation, mm-hmm. the advantage of partnering with uh, one of our local supported employment agencies compared to another. So, so really our primary focus is to, to inform businesses, to provide opportunities for them to learn about the different agencies. And again, if they have um, a need that they can contact us and we will link them to the appropriate, to, to the appropriate agency. Um, so, so that's really, again, I don't want to take credit for the work of our partner agencies because they do the actual work. And our job is to simply be that linkage and, and, and that way for businesses to learn about, uh, about that. I, I think the only other thing I would say is that the way that our agencies typically approach businesses is to knock on doors. Mm-hmm. And, and the problem with that can be that if you knock on the door of a big business, very rarely will you actually get to the person you need to talk to. We have had situations where that's happened. Uh, as a matter of fact, Franklin Templeton, the business that we partnered with at our last business advisory council, literally a job coach knocked on the door and was actually put in per- touch with the right person in a big agency, but that very rarely happens. Mm-hmm. Opportunity for, the, for those big businesses to send the right people to our events and to talk to those people and again, hear from other businesses rather than as a sales pitch from me or a sales pitch from a supported employment agency, you know, that's, that's a big service in itself because again, they want to hear from businesses. They want to, you know, to, to make the linkage with the right person. But most of the work happens from our partner agencies. I never want to, you know, to, to lose sight of that or to, to, you know, to not give credit where that credit is due. Well, Steve, I think you're just way too humble because you are the chairperson for the BAC and you are the one to coordinate all of the meetings that involve all of the business partners and um, service providers. So I I do give you some credit for, you know, all (laughs) the the work and support that we all do. Um, So Steve, um, so if I were a business, how can I get involved with the BAC? So one of the things that we encourage people to do is we do have the Business Advisory Council uh, uh, webpage on the UC Davis Mind Institute's uh, site. Uh, but, but businesses can contact us directly at norcal.bac at gmail.com. They can also contact me directly. I, I've actually have had a few businesses, you know, contact me directly and I have put them in touch with, with different agencies. Um, and the final way is if you go to the, the UC Davis Mine Institute's YouTube page, um, we have a couple of Business Advisory Council meetings that have been videotaped. We had one at SMUD mm-hmm. that was taped uh, that you can see the full thing and it has the video about the BAC and again, our contact information. And last Wednesday's event will also be posted after that gets fully captioned onto that uh, UC Davis Mine Institute's YouTube channel. And so, so if you just type Business Advisory Council into that, that YouTube channel, you'll find it that way. But directly, the, way, the best way for businesses to directly contact us is at our norcal.bac at gmail.com um, um, email address. And I believe there's also Facebook and LinkedIn information as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, we don't have an actual Facebook page that I'm familiar okay. with, but we do have a LinkedIn. And again, if you just, if you go into LinkedIn and you type in Northern California Business Advisory Council, uh, it, it, we're the only one that exists with that type. 
we, we actually chose a very, very grandiose title to say that the Northern California Business Advisory Council as compared to Sacramento. Yeah, so, you know, Steve, you, you touched um, a little bit about um, the supports that the BAC offer to businesses. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about the benefits of becoming involved? So there's, for businesses, the benefits are that, first of all, um, if, if you're a large business, small businesses have the benefit, if they want to add someone, it's really just a matter of finding the right person and the right fit and hiring that person. But for, it, and this is one of the confusions about that, that I oftentimes hear from service providers and families is that they believe that large businesses do not want to hire people with de developmental disabilities. And the reality that's is, is that when we have talked directly with those big businesses, they are very interested in doing, and they, and they have learned to understand the importance of it. The problem is that big businesses, they have uh, human resource policies including UC Davis. I'm very familiar with this because I sit on a hiring panel for UC Davis. And there are th there are ways that employees typically have to enter into the workforce at a large business. You have to submit a, a, a resume. You have to be very, very successful in your interview. And there are clear guidelines that you cannot break because you want someone to be hired or you think that they would be a good fit if they don't match the job classification and they don't score the highest on that, uh, you know, on, on that uh, interview, you can't hire them. So one of the things that the Business Array Council has done with these big businesses and SMUD was one of our very first uh, business that figured out a process to do this is they've have created a side channel using the paid internship model mm -hmm. to bring people in and through an alternative to the resume interview format. And once people have shown they're successful, they, they have, they've developed a channel that, that the human resource uh, department approves where that person can be permanently hired. Franklin Templeton learned partly from the SMUD model. And then just recently, um, uh, the Sacramento Superior Courthouse, they have also developed a side channel to do this. So, so one of the advantages for a business is first of all, being connected to the different partner agencies, but, but on a broader level of learning from the experience of, of other big businesses that have developed these departments. And, and again, the event that we did last Wednesday of uh, Melina from Franklin Templeton, she really spelled out some concrete ways that if you want to create something like their ability recruitment program, mm -hmm. there are very concrete steps you need to take in order to make that happen. It, it, and it, it typically, for a large business, it can take up to a year to get all of those things approved through your business. And, and again, I work at UC Davis and we're in the starting point of doing that at UC Davis. And I can, I can already see that again, it's not simply saying to someone, let's do this and then being able to say, yes, let's, let's do it. There's people that have to approve it. And so there's a way of going about that in a, you know, that businesses can learn from others who've already done it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very impressed by the presentation that Franklin Templeton did yes, uh, last week. And, um, you know, more importantly, I was impressed of how the program has grown to um, other um, cities where, you know, they have headquarters. So, um, you know, besides Franklin Templeton and SMUD, um, are there any other businesses that have become involved with the BAC? That you oh, know? well. Yeah, so, you know, again, we have recognized uh, a, you know, a wide variety of businesses. We've got CentOS, which is a uniform uh, delivery, well, uni uniform cleaning and delivery service. Uh, uh, we've got um, the um, X is, is, 
has has been a, a big partner with us. Um, we 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 honored a, a Weikert Realty, uh, which 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 uh, had had hired someone, and really had made a, a commitment towards doing some things. Um, so we we've, we've recognized and have have had partners with a tremendous variety of businesses, at both in terms of size and throughout the the business sectors that that exist. Including uh, Mark and Monica Pizza is another place that 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 we recognized a couple of year, years ago. So everything from pizza to uh, FedEx to uh, you know uh, the the energy uh, at Smud. I, it's it's been a hugely widely you know varied kind of, of businesses that we've engaged in. Wow, that's so awesome, Steve, and I'm so honored to be um, a partner of the BAC. Um, Kathy, do we have any questions from the chat? Yeah, no, nobody's posed a question in the chat, but does anybody want to ask a question um, just out loud here or put it in the chat? Anyone? Okay, very quiet group. Right. I yeah. think we, we need to um, offer everybody um, afternoon coffee. <laughs> all right well thank you so much steve um for your time and for the valuable information regarding the bac um could you please put your contact information in the chat for those um that may want to reach out to you for additional information or to share information regarding um, the bac we're also going to be including this information um in the email that Sonia will be sending out um, after the meeting today. Yeah. So, Cindy, can I ask Steve a question? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Steve, we talked a lot about businesses, but um, and, and Kathy's actually been the one primarily responsible in our office for um, collaborating with the back and being a part of the back. Um, but I know um, that there's a huge role in terms of your coordination with the uh, service providers, the support and employment agencies, and that role has been really, really important too, so that they can all get to know each other and share job leads when there's, when one agency maybe doesn't have someone, you know, to, to that everybody knows each other and can work together as a team as opposed to maybe competing against each other, or if one group is really working with, say, SMUD and another group wants to contact them, they can just do more coordination. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thank you, Sonia. Um, yeah, it, it really is a, a situation to where, it, especially when a business is looking for someone with a very specialized skill set, mm -hmm. if they happen to have a relationship with one supported employment agency, but that that agency does not have you know someone with that skill set, it is an opportunity for them to pass that lead rather than telling the business we don't have anyone. You know, it's an opportunity to meet that business need by sharing resource, and um, and on top of that, you know, just one of the things that I'll be honest is that you know, as someone who's worked my entire career within the regional center service system and had some linkage with the Department of Rehabilitation, but you know, that wasn't as common as as it has been in the past few years. But the one service agency that I, to be honest, up until the time of the Business Advisory Council, I had no understanding of, and many of our, of our agencies didn't either, was mm -hmm. job centers. And, and, and so to have all those agencies working together and sharing, you know, information about, oh, well, you know, if you, if, if, if you link, you know, if you, if you bring someone to the American Job Center, we can assist not only with developing a resume, but we can practice interview skills. We can um, we can uh, create uh, a, a a profile regarding uh, the types of employment that may that may be you know uh, well fitted for 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 an individual. And then after they do all of their pre-employment work, they can refer to someone that they've actually worked with at the Department of Rehabilitation or with the regional center. And one of the things that 
we have found is not just the relationships that have happened within the professionals who are part of the Business Advisor Council, but again, making sure that, that if I have someone who approaches me at the Mind Institute, that I can call Jessica at, at Golden Sierra uh, Job Training Center and have a conversation with, uh, with her about the specific, you know, without providing, you know, client details that I shouldn't, but have a conversation and, and make sure that they get a direct handoff to someone who I know is going to take care of them. Mm -hmm. And then after Jessica works with that person, she has a warm handoff to someone that she knows is going to take care of them in another agency. Those personal relationships on, you know, between the professionals really translates to the clients that we're serving having a very different thing if they just walk into one of these agencies and no one knows who they are and no one knows necessarily how to support them well. Um, that, you know, when they, when we refer someone and we know who we're referring to, and uh, there's that accountability and that, that knowledge base that's been shared between us, um, the, the services are very, very different. And so that inner, the, those inner workings that, that happen with the different agencies is really, really critical. Well, there are a couple of questions in the chat now. Um, Mary's asking, uh, Steve, is there a Southern California equivalent to the NorCal back? So there is, again, the, uh, the Business Advisor Council, and it, it was funny, I attended a workshop in Southern California in, in 2015 that my, Michael Rosenberg was doing, who's the transition, you know, a big transition coordinator in, this, in Southern California. And I did that probably in March or something. And in October, we did our first event that year, kind of building on the success of the, the Business Advisory Council from that area. The only thing is that that Southern California uh, Business Advisory Council is, again, a transition one. To my knowledge, we're the only one, the only Business Advisory Council that has focused on adult services. And I hugely encourage uh, adult services to band together and create this. It doesn't, it, there's no, the only thing that's required is for the team to get together and say, let's do it. Mm -hmm. um, there is no, you know, there's no like hurdles that people have to jump outside of just getting together in a room and say, let's, let's start to put this together. We did it in, I mean, we, we went from talking about it in March to doing the first event in October, which was crazy. <laughs> um, but literally we formed, we, we formed it in probably two or three months. We had an up and running business advisor council and other places can do that as well. Yeah. It's so true, Steve. I mean, and again, like Cindy said, kudos to you for your collaboration and your networking with all the, the, folks and entities that need to be part of that. Um, Amanda, Amanda has a question. Um, would you like to ask it out loud, Amanda? Yeah, I would. Um, I was wondering, you were saying that the MIND Institute was trying to like figure out how to work like SMED is working. And um, like, what their process is for, for doing that? So at, at UC Davis, again, um, we've been working on this for a number of years, um, but it, we are just now starting to have uh, more departments who um, have agreed to, um, to, to really begin to work with us on, on creating that, that structure of using paid internships and other kinds of things. Um, so at this point, we don't have like an open uh, pipeline for that. And, mm -hmm. and the way it typically would work is 
just as with all of the other ones that have, you know, with SMUD and Franklin Templeton, typically uh, it would be linked to one or more service providers um, who would uh, uh, go through the process of screening people, doing some advanced uh, prep to, in terms of job readiness, and then supporting people on site. Um, so, more th again, although we haven't really fully fleshed this out, more than likely it's going to be tied to specific service providers who will be doing that work with, within the departments. Okay. Great. Thank okay. you so much, Steve. Is there, are there any other questions from the chat? Yes. Mary has another question. Um, how could community-based organizations uh, connect more effectively with job support agencies as a resource to our families? So community-based, so I, 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 I'm not quite, so I, I understand the part about how can the, the, the job um, agencies connect more with families. I'm not sure about the community-based. I, I can clarify, community-based meaning nonprofit um, uh, organizations that uh, support and, uh, you know, serve community families. Okay. So are you looking for, as, are you looking to connect with a supported employment agency to get assistance in your, in your uh, community-based service or organization? Or? It could possibly on that end, but um, more or less um, like to be able to share, um, educate our families as to, you know, how their, their services work and even to introduce them sort of us to serve as a liaison to other businesses as you mentioned you know with right. them with the door knocking sometimes we have that contact and we would like to be able to you know get uh expand uh job opportunities for the 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 individuals of our family so we could Perfect. be that um you know that handoff so you know mary the first thing is is that feel free to contact me and uh, I can help you to connect with, you know, the agencies that exist in your, in your, in your area. But the one thing I would say is that, um, again, one of the, the hugely overlooked uh, supports that are out there is American Job Centers. For, for many people with disabilities, uh, they, may not, you know, they may or may not qualify for regional center services. Um, many people do qualify for the Department of Rehabilitation, uh, although there's some that don't. And the cool thing about the America Job Centers is that they are a generic resource. Anybody who's looking for employment can receive services from the, from the American Job Centers. But with all that said, you know, if, if you really want to be connecting families to these agencies, it's good to connect with, uh, and, and Cindy would could clarify whether or not this is accurate, but all regions, regional centers do have an employment specialist that could kind of help you understand, you know, which supported employment agencies exist in your area. Then there's the Department of Rehabilitation and finally connecting with the American Job Centers. If you cover all three of those, then you really do have a good base that, that any family who's looking for employment could connect with one of those agencies for, for support. And Cindy, I'm just curious, could, is, is that accurate that they could reach out to the Regional Center uh, Employment Specialist? I would recommend to reach out to the service coordinator because anyone that qualifies for Regional Center services will have a service coordinator who is going to help coordinate services for them. So any service that the family is looking for um, can be discussed at the planning team and, and that involves the service coordinator and the service coordinator can um, gather resources and information to share with the family and sometimes that um, could mean you know they would reach out to me for um, information regarding service providers. Any other questions Kathy? Um, yes Amanda has another question um, um, 
how could I be able to shadow a friend or mentor at his or her job for a day? Is it even possible? You know, Amanda, uh, job shadowing is a, uh, is a uh, common support that, that uh, employment agencies do. Um, and so it is possible for, for, for that to be arranged. If, you, if you're being served by uh, an agency, I would recommend that, that, you, that you talk and coordinate that with the agency that's, that you're working with. Uh, if you're not being served by an agency, then it really is a matter of talking to your friend or mentor and having them get that clearance ahead of time that it's okay to bring someone uh, on site so that you can so that you can shadow or and see what kind of you know the work that they do. Um, and so it, but it is a, it is a common strategy that is being used. Um, so it's something that you could do as long as the, the business has approved it. Does that answer your question, Amanda? She's on mute, but I hope so. Yeah, okay, awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much, Steve, um, for your time today. Again, Steve's information is going to be in the chat. And it is there. Um, yes, yeah. it is. And Sonia is also going to include his contact information in the email that she's going to be sending out to everyone. Um, so moving on to our next presenter, I am pleased to introduce you to Dee Gavadon, uh, who will help us um, explain the benefits of working while maintaining Social Security benefits. Um, Dee, would you please unmute yourself? I think I just did. Did I? Awesome. Yes, you did. <clears throat> Good, good afternoon. This is kind of a dry topic for a late afternoon, so I appreciate everybody who's here. <laughs> uh, my name is Dee Gaveldon. I work for Crossroads Diversified Services, which is now a, a, a pride business organization. I've worked for Crossroads for 26 years. Um, I've been the benefits, I've been involved in benefits planning for over 30, 30 years, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, and I certainly appreciate any questions that come up. Again, I want to make this relevant. One of the problems, a lot of times I'll get questions about personal um, experiences uh, with, with benefits. And those are hard to answer in this kind of um, format um, because um, I, I don't have all the, um, the, 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 the background. Um, so, but if you have any personal questions, I think my contact information is available. Um, and um, then the conversation can be deeper into um, experiences you may have. Um, Crossroads has direct funding from the Social Security Administration to provide benefits planning services. Uh, to individuals who are working, have a job offer, or in a, are involved in a um, formal job search. We're, we're here to help people um, debunk some of the myths about going to work, acknowledge some of the difficulties that um, people have going, beneficiary going to work with Social Security. I'm not going to say it's always easy. It's always easy. And then also help individuals use the available work incentives um, that Social Security has available for both SSI and Social Security beneficiaries who are working or planning on working. Help guide you through the options that um, a person, uh, individual has access to. Um, because it is a government, um, bureaucracy um, and a lot of this, these work incentives were developed by Congress over a long period of time. Um, and the wisdom, SSI and Social Security have different work incentives. The count income different, even how they count income is different and when they count income is different. 
makes it very difficult for beneficiaries, their families, case managers, other support systems. But as I always say, it's kept me employed for 30 years. Um, every so often there is, uh, well, almost every congressional uh, session, there are, uh, there's a bill to, that's introduced to make the work incentives easier, up, up, um, bring them up to the 21st century because some of the uh, work incentives go back 40 years and um, need, need updating. Um, do you want to do the poll first? Yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, why don't we go ahead and launch the poll first? Just got to get where people's deeper. ideas are. Yeah, yeah, before we delve deep, deeper into the issue of Social Security. So, okay. um, Sonia has the poll question up. Yeah, so the question is, what are the fears about working or returning to work for your family member, consumer that you support or yourself? Um, and the options are COVID-19 and staying safe on the job. The second is impact on benefits. So impact of wages on your benefits, uh, lack of job supports to relearn job or find a new job. Having wages go up and down is challenging. And that would be if you were working and then not working and then working again. Uh, job duties have changed due to COVID. Effect on unemployment benefits and I don't want to work any longer or right now. Thank you so much, Sonia. Go ahead and take a few minutes to uh, select one or multiple. And if there's, this is Dee again, if there's other concerns, feel free to put them in chat and we'll try to address those. Great, thank you, Dee. So we have a tie for COVID-19 and impact on benefits. Okay. Okay, well, w wait one more minute and then we'll stop it. Okay, there you go, Cindy. Awesome, okay. So COVID-19 and staying safe on the job has 65% of the vote. Impact on benefits, tie. Um, with 65% of the vote. Lack of job supports to relearn um, job or find a new job has 42%. Having wages go up and down is challenging has 23%. Job duties have changed due to COVID has 42% of the vote. Effect on unemployment benefits has 31% of the vote. And I don't want to work any longer or right now has 12% of the vote. So thank you so much everyone for um, your vote. Um, okay, so D, um, to continue the, the discussion about- um, There are some in the and, chat too. Oh, I'm so sorry, yes. Um, let's see. Okay, yes, yes. Amanda brought up some really legitimate concerns. Um, having seizures, not being able to um, drive, having a service dog and having the diagnosis of autism could be reasons why people um, are not working or um, don't want to return to a job. And Okay, so um, Krista said none of the um, answers were applicable to his sister because her sister wants to go back to work. Okay. Okay, fair okay. enough. Well, thank you so much. Um, so Dee, I have heard a lot about the um, Cal ABLE program and special needs trust. Can you please explain the difference between the two? Okay. Um, I, can I um, respond to some of the questions from the poll first? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, some uh, some COVID-19 has upended our workforce uh, for people with disabilities and people without disabilities over the last seven months. Um, I've worked at home since March 13th, never thought that seven months later I'd still be working at home. And, um, and we are for the near future. So COVID-19 is this big wraparound of the economy, individuals, employment, 
and I recognize the difficulties people have had, um, especially those with disabilities trying to maintain work, deciding if maybe it's uh, too precarious on their health to go to work. In Sacramento and I'm pro probably other places, there was cutbacks uh, on public transportation, not um, due to fewer riders. And it has just been um, cat almost cataclysmic mm -hmm. uh, how the pandemic has filtered through all of its, all of the, um, the elements of working for both the employee, the employer, big businesses, small businesses. As a country, we were just not prepared. And as a world, we just weren't prepared for something of this size and with the health and with the, this, these types of health risks. Um, very soon after uh, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization and then by our own CDC, many of our clients were laid off. Um, and we and my team, I'm the manager of the WIPA program, Work Incentive Planning and Assistance Program. We, the calls that we started receiving were not about going to work, but now they were laid off and getting unemployment benefits and the federal augmentation and the stimulus $1,200 payment and $500 for independence. There was a lot of fear. What great money, but what does this mean to my benefits? So I just want to speak just very briefly on that because there's a lot of confusion. And this applies to the stimulus package that was passed back in April that has expired. Mm -hmm. um, there's new ones coming out uh, possibly and they may have their own rules attached. But for SSI benefits, the unemployment, let me start with social security disability. Social security disability is not a excuse me, means tested benefit and neither is Medicare. So the stimulus payment and unemployment has nothing to do or has any impact on social security disability or Medicare. That's the good news. For SSI, the stimulus payment does not affect, is not considered income and or resource, does not, it's not the stimulus payment of 1200 or if there were dependents, the, the extra $500 per dependent never counts toward um, SSI as income. However, it could count as a resource, but there's nine months from the time a person gets it um, that it can be held on to and doesn't count as a resource. Um, so, and that would be for SSI and Medi-Cal. However, there was part of the bill um, and the stimulus package that um, people who became un ineligible for Medi-Cal could continue to keep their Medi-Cal. Now that may have ended, the, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so trying to parse some of the verbiage can be difficult. I'm not sure if that still holds at the federal level or if that still holds at the state level, because state had some other um, legislation regarding Medi-Cal. Um, but uh, the bottom line is SSI or Medi-Cal doesn't affect, not for not, has no effect for nine months from the time it's received. So with all the, the, uh, the good news or the bad news, the effects um, on on people's lives, that's the one good, um, one good news on the, um, the, the payments. So we were spent a lot of time answering these questions. Um, Social Security had also put a break on uh, recovering overpayments and that has passed. So people will start, if there was income of, with, uh, with the unemployment benefits or earnings, um, from work or s other types of earnings that could affect SSI, those overpayment notices or review notices are starting to come out. Um, if it's related to work, certainly give my team a call if you're in our catchment area, or if you're not, give us a call and we'll direct you to your catchment area so you can talk to a WIPA provider. Or if it's a quick question, we'll certainly help you. Um, and I'm sorry, Cindy, you asked a question and I put, I 
deferred it and I don't remember what it was. <laughs> That's okay. But thank you so much for that information. That is very interesting. Um, so my question was, um, what is the difference between the account able account and the special needs trust? Okay. Really, really good question. And um, one of the problems I'm having is I get no reaction from the from the community if if I'm being understood, if uh, you're if people are getting what I'm saying. I'm not used to not having inter interaction. So um, thank you for your patience. As I'm probably leaving big pauses. Um, so the I'm going to start with the CalABLE account. Uh, CalABLE or the ABLE accounts was passed by federal legislation in 2004. No, 2014, excuse me. And one of the concerns has been that young people who receive needs-based um, means-tested benefits like SSI and Medi-Cal have no way of improving their financial uh, situation um, when there's a dependency on the cash benefit, but often more the um, the medical benefits. And if income is too high, depending on what income, and with Medi-Cal tied to SSI, if a person tr attempted to improve themselves, they may lose that those necessary benefits. So Congress in started looking at this um, conundrum of keeping young people trapped into, into benefits and um, kind of a disincentive, disincentivizing them from reaching their full potential. And you can say, well, this could be for um, middle-aged people, older people who have disabilities and are on needs-based uh, benefits. And I totally get that and I agree. But Congress started with if your disability occurred prior to the age of 26, they wanted to give young people an opportunity to build assets, build income, and not affect those um, means-tested benefits. So the ABLE um, account option came out, and it's a very flexible um, and self-directed um, program that allows, in most cases, individuals to set up their own financial plan, be responsible for their own financial well-being, and still being able to receive these necessary benefits. So the first um, rule of thumb is, or the first uh, regulation is that the disability has to occur prior to the age of 26. And it doesn't mean a person has to receive SSI or social security disability. It, they can self-certify that they had a disability that roughly meets the uh, social security blue, bo uh, blue book um, manual of disability impairments, which is very complicated. It also allows the CalABLE account, we always have to be in different in California. So the federal legislation is the ABLE account. We call it CalABLE, just like Medicaid, we call Medi-Cal here. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the CalABLE account acts like long-term um, long asset building device that's managed by a third party investment company. Can't, I can never remember which the company's name. I always assumed it was going to be end up with Fidelity, but it wasn't. Um, and a person can contribute their own money, or some, or a family or friends can contribute money up up to five, fifteen thousand dollars a year into the CalAble account. The it is, the interest is tax free. Um, already paid taxes on the the money that's going in, unless it's from uh, a relative or friend, then there's no tax involvement. But if, if it's earnings, you know, um, after tax net earnings can be um, contributed to the CalABLE account. And the limit is 15,000 a year, unless you're employed. And then the, uh, 
under certain circumstances, and there's, um, what's the word I used in my notes? Um, if you're employed, uh, the don't, uh, contributions can be more than 15,000 within, if the, if the person is not participating in an employer approved retirement plan, like a 403B or a 401K, 401k within restrictions, potentially up to about 27,000 a year. Mm. Um, and the account can accrue up to $100,000 with no effect on SSI benefits. And up in California, up to 529,000, and it won't affect Medi-Cal. That's awesome. And unlike the special needs of trust that I'll talk about a little in a minute, the person, unless they have um, otherwise cannot manage their own finances to their best interest, has access to the money. And, it, the, and how the money can be used is wide open. The intent is long-term savings, building assets, but the money can be used for mortgages, rent, down payments, transportation costs, education costs, mm -hmm. going for, on a vacation. There's very little, there's very little that, um, that is not a legitimate expense. So one thing I, when I was at a training, illicit drugs, it won't let you, um, <laughs> purchasing illicit drugs is not on the allowable expense, but it is that wide open. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like having a long-term investment savings account as that the person can draw on any time, time they want. Mm -hmm. In um, the special needs trust, it is much more restrictive. One, the funds have to be held in trust for the beneficiary by somebody else, and the beneficiary cannot have access to it. Um, they cannot draw themselves. They cannot be, they're the, I always get this, they're the trustee, trustor, and they cannot, if any of the money from the special needs trust um, is, uh, the, the beneficiary has individual access to that would affect Medi-Cal and, Medi Medi -Cal and SSI. And the monies cannot be used for the purposes of SSI. So it, the money well, I could go to a down payment of a house, repair of a house. It could not go toward a mortgage payment or a rent payment. Can't be used to buy food. Um, so those very basic needs um, is not allowable under the special needs trust. Um, but it can. But the special needs trust money with the trust was it trustee or trustor, the one who manages the trust. Um, um, can access the money on behalf of the uh, beneficiary for the purposes of vacations, um, um, down payments. The money just cannot go through the beneficiary. So if I were a beneficiary and my uncle had a special needs trust held on my, my benefit and I wanted to go to, um, to the East Coast to visit friends, my uncle would have to purchase the ticket directly from the airline mm -hmm. and he would give me the ticket. It can't go, the money can't go to me to purchase the ticket. So there's more legal um, uh, restrictions on the use of the special needs trust and how it is accessed. So those are the basic differences and there are more, but those are the, Mm -hmm. um, the basic differences, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, the just for sake of time, and I know that we're going to have some more questions coming um, through the chat. I have a couple more questions that I'd like to um, ask, and, and I think, you know, this is um, important information that um, I sure. believe the um, listeners would like to hear. Um, can you please tell us the difference between SSI and SSDI, as well as Medicare and Medi-Cal? Sure. SSI is administered by the Social Security Administration, but it is not paid out of the Social Security Trust Fund. Uh, SSI is not based on work history. It's, it, um, while the D 
disability the, the disabled the disability requirement is the same as for SSI and Social Security. SSI is also about how much money do you have in the bank and other income. Same thing with Medi-Cal. SSI and Medi-Cal are married. In California, if you get SSI, you automatically get Medi-Cal. Social Security is based on either the um, a beneficiary's own work history or and or uh, if the disability onset was under the age of 22, a beneficiary can draw on their parents' um, social security benefits if the parent is disabled, deceased, or retired and drawing social security benefits. Um, and social security and Medicare are married. And unlike SSI, social security is not means tested, nor is, uh, uh, is Medicare. Um, an example would be Bill Gates is entitled to receive, you know, Bill Gates, the owner of Microsoft, the chair of Microsoft, pro could get a social security check and probably is on Medicare because it's not means tested while SSI is. So that's a very high level difference. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, can you tell us what SSDI stands for again? Sure, Social Security Disability Insurance. Okay. It is paid out of the same funds as uh, retirement benefits and survivor benefits. The okay, so how, how does one qualify for uh, SSI or SSDI? Okay, first, the first requirement is that assuming the person is under the age of 65 or full retirement be benefits, um, if they, and they qualify based on disability, they have to have a disability that meets or exceeds the criteria threshold of Social Security and a person cannot earn um, over, doesn't have the ability, physical or mental ability to earn over substantial gainful activity and they're unable to perform any job that is in significant numbers in the national economy and the disability is expected to last a minimum of 12 months or end in death. That is the legal <laughs> definition of disability. Both SSI and Social Security have the same definition of, of disability unless the person's blind and it's a little different. But basically, an example I use if I were a uh, a construction worker and I hurt my back and hurt my shoulder and I could no longer do construction work that that doesn't mean I'm disabled under the Social Security Act the mm -hmm. Social Security will look at some things like my age and other criteria and then if I am able physically or mentally to do another job that exists in significant numbers in our economy Basically what that means is, okay, they'll agree I can't do construction work, but can I do sedentary work or less physically demanding work? They don't ask if I have the training. They don't ask if I have the educational or aptitude for or interest in another type of job. All they look at is if I can physically or mentally do a less physically demanding job. Very, very high standard. Great, thank you for that information. Sure. See, um, right now, I would like to go ahead and pull um, some questions from the chat. Okay. One of them has to do with unemployment benefits and how that may affect um, the benefits. So, okay. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. It will not affect the Social Security disability benefits at all or the Medicare. It does affect SSI dollar for dollar. It's a, a, unemployment is considered unearned income. So if you receive $600 from SSI socials and you get $400 from, SS, uh, from unemployment, your, a person's SSI will be reduced by $480 due to a $20 disregard. So basically dollar for dollar. Do you, do you only get 
SSI or SSDI? For what, in what context? Disability. Yeah, a lot of people um, get both, Amanda. Yeah. Good yeah, question. both oh. people can get both. People can get both. Yes. If you qualify. Yes. If you qualify. Most people who receive disability benefits, I think it's a plurality that receive both. Huh. Okay. And it depends on the individual's financial situation and if what work history they have. It's really kind of complicated. If you don't have a work history? You'll probably um, receive SSI. Okay, I should tell a my dad to look into that. Unless a person can qualify under a parent's family benefit, but and but most cases an individual receives SSI. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Cindy, I'm going to go ahead and launch the final poll, and then we'll have a few minutes to ask additional questions, if that's okay. Yes. Go okay. Ahead. Yeah, because there are a couple questions in the chat we can ask. Okay. Okay. So here's our last poll. And um, thank you for participating. The first question is, did you learn something about business outreach with Steve and benefits counseling with Dee? Um, yes or no? Um, pretty low bar. It's, did you learn something? <laughs> and uh, the second question is, are you satisfied with this activity? Yes or no? Whoops. Got to launch it so you can all see it. There we go. Um, are you satisfied with this activity? Yes or no? Um, we are federally funded and they like to know that we're actually doing trainings and sharing information. So thank you for participating. And then as soon as we're done, we'll, we'll have about 10 more minutes for questions. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end it so we can continue on with questions. Um, I do see one person said they're not satisfied. So um, if that is the case, please feel free to follow up with us. Um, let us know what it is that you didn't learn or that you expected differently from what we advertised. Um, and, and we want to make sure you get the information that you need. So feel free to send an email to us. Um, and again, I will follow up uh, with an email in the next couple of days with uh, maybe a few handouts and link to the recording. I'm turning it back over to you, Cindy. All right, thank you so much, Sonia. So um, at the moment, I would like to take a question from the chat and it looks like Lynn has a situation that she would like to address. Okay. Um, so she has a client who pays $25 into the Working Disabled Program um, she just recently received notice that she can no longer be in the program because she's no longer with Department of Rehabilitation. Um, and she has been paying into the program before she was a client of DOR. Can Medi-Cal deny her benefits? Okay. So is this the working Medi-Cal for the working disabled? You know, I am not sure, but if Lynn yes. can unmute herself. Thank you, Lynn. Yes. Okay, so being a client of the Department of Rehabilitation has no bearing on the Medi-Cal Working Disabled program, so I'm not sure how or why that decision was made. It could be that it's the person is no longer employed, and after a person, if a person is, they have to be working um, to um, have uh, access to the Working Disabled Medi-Cal program, if they stop working, it's either, and I don't remember the exact time frame, either four or six months post-employment to continue um, to receive benefits under that program. So I'm not sure about how the department- Yeah, now she's working. She's, she's worked all the way through. She works part-time and, uh, and she's worked all the way through uh, COVID. So I don't I understand. I thought that was really weird, yeah. I don't, I don't understand know. that at all. And that's what it says on the document that. Yeah. Hmm. How odd. Well, if you want to give me a call and. Oh, yeah. For my staff to look at it, we need a, yeah. need a release. Great. And we'll figure that out. We've, we've had some interesting conversations with. Are you in the Sacramento area? No, I'm in, in Southern California. Okay. 
Um, let, let me take a look at it. It's, it's out of our catchment area, but I can hook you up with, uh, with our like programs to help you out. How's that? That would be great. So okay. who do, how do I get in contact with you? Oh, I guess that's important. Sorry. <laughs> um, one of the questions I was going to ask you. <laughs> um, probably the best is my, through my email. Okay. You have that, Cindy? I think you do. I have your email, but uh, we can go ahead and let Sonia include that information in the chat. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Dee. I appreciate Thank that. You, You're very welcome. Okay. Dee, the next question actually came through yesterday um, okay. for us via email. I think it's important, so I like to go ahead and, and ask that question. Mm -hmm. um, so a client was getting paid some minimum wage, but now getting paid minimum wage. And, you know, um, for the people that are on the line, if you don't understand what some minimum wage means, um, it's basically wages that is paid based on the person's mm -hmm. productivity level versus the prevailing wage. Okay. So the question is, because she's now getting paid minimum wage, will her SSI benefits get reduced? Okay. The short answer is yes. Um, for SSI, the short answer is yes. Basically, SSI, going into a lot of detail. Oh, sorry. The SSI will count half of the gross wages. There, there could be some offsets. So we need to look into that a little deeper. For social security disability um, and SSI, looks at income and then there's a there's a formula on how much earned earned income wages are counted social security works on thresholds and so ssi benefit can be reduced based on income social security disability is an all or nothing you get all the benefit or you get none of the benefit um Social security disability has something, uses something that's called um, a subsidy or special conditions. And if the person who is working now minimum wage needs a lot of support to maintain their employment, the amount of support can be deducted from their gross wages. So even if over the threshold that social security would determine whether or not a person would still receive their social security benefits, Oftentimes, there's a reduction enough where a person can continue to receive their social security disability. And that's something that keeps us very busy the last couple of years as more um, organizations are, um, are giving up their, their waiver, their wages waiver, I can't remember what it's called, their sub-minimum wage waiver on going to um, minimum wage, competitive wages. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it looks like we do have a clarifying uh, question okay. from Krista. Um, Krista, I'm not quite sure what you are trying to ask, but I know it has something to do with uh, one of the examples that Dee had given earlier. Would you mind unmuting yourself and maybe asking <laughs> directly? So, um, so we are the trustees of my sister-in-law's um, special needs trust mm -hmm. that her parents have set up. So they're, they're still around another probably 10 years. Okay. But uh, from what I understand, there's about 50,000 a year in this trust for her, which I find excessive, but that's fine. Um, so uh, I was under the assumption that my husband and I would be um, paying everything for her out of the special needs trust. So if we wanted to buy her a house instead of having her live with us, cause I'm losing my mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, she could live in the neighborhood and we check right. on her and blah, blah, blah. Um, we could buy her a house yes. and then we buy her all the toilet paper and all the stuff that she needs. Like we currently do now, cause I'm her disability payee right now. Mm -hmm. And I think her disability will drop probably to zero since she's making minimum wage and she's going to be flush with cash. Um, so I just, when it said that you couldn't buy food or something with the right. needs trust, I was like, I bet you could get around it. Um, <laughs> you know, like buying gift cards or something for the 99 cent store and saying, go crazy, honey. You know, <laughs> uh, let me say, let me put it this way. The, um, the reason it's called special needs trust is it's 
the purpose is to provide um, a resource for beneficiaries on SSI or other people. But um, for this um, for this discussion for people on SSI or Medi-Cal and or Medi-Cal to help them with, re with expenses that are not related to the purpose of SSI. And SSI is um, the, the foundation, the, the purpose of SSI is to make sure people have a place to live and food to eat. So if it's, those funds are used for that purpose, it could have effect on SSI. Okay. Yeah, if okay. you give um, someone a gift card, how they spend it, you don't know. Okay, right. Obviously, I'd like her to keep her disability benefits. I just get concerned uh, because she is making the minimum wage now, and all, I think it's going to drop considerably, which is fine, whatever. Um, but now we have to kind of um, take control or her father of how she's spending her money because she okay. will go to the 99 cent store and go crazy. <laughs> sure, <laughs> so everything's a dollar. Obviously, you have to have family involved in some of right. this. Right. So yeah. I, I appreciate this talk today. Sure. Um, Chris, Kristen, definitely watch some of those videos online because there's really clear yes. um, uh, videos on uh, Cal Able. And one thing that she could do, you could leave the special needs trust alone, and I'm not giving legal advice, but right. <laughs> um, but she could use put some of her wages into the Cal Able account. Okay. And then she okay. does have access to that, and they do issue a like an ATM card. Mm -hmm. So she could have a certain amount on that card, and I believe that you can control um, how much she would have access on that card. And so she would have the ability to be spending the money that she's earning. Um, and that would be coming from her wages. And so there's no limit to what she could spend it on when it's in that Calable account. Okay. But when it's a special needs, it is special money and it is um, more restricted. And it's also not something she okay. should have a access to, right? It's not supposed Correct. to be given to Correct. her. So, right. But she could use her wages to set up the Calable account. She does have to pay a, a fee to have that account. It's quite low, an annual fee um, but she would then have the and, and a lot of what this, the Cal Able account is about is people having more control over their right. own lives mm -hmm. and so that account is in their name and so there's a pride and some skills mm -hmm. to learn right. about managing her money and so that's a great thing it's not trusted in someone right, else's right, right. name right. but right. Um, but you could work that out and you could have both so they have different yes. purposes okay. But a special oh. needs trust could actually purchase a house for the person. Yes. Okay. Even though housing is also in, in the, right. you know. It's the rent and the mortgage, but okay. the purchase of the house is fine. Okay. And there's some really good resources online if you use them, um, you know, that, the, you know, make sure they're legitimate um, um, resources because they do some also side by side differences between the two. Mm -hmm. um, Dee, I was actually got to touch um, on that next was, you know, can you um, send us some resources um, to share with the sure. families and also service providers and people on the call today, of such course. as the DB101, the calculator? Mm -hmm. Great, thank okay. you. For, this, for the um, special needs trust and the Cal Abel account, I have a service dog and I was wondering, like, which is the better place to, like, have her funds in? Your dog's funds? Yeah. Both Probably a cal. Them. Yeah. Depends both on what the funds are. are. Yeah. Both, um, both types of accounts can be used to support a service dog. Eventually, I'm going to have to buy a new one, but not right. <laughs> Sorry, Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that's not a good right question. Now. Yeah, I know they specifically talk about um, supports for service dogs, that that is something that you can use in your Cal Able funds. But yeah, you're yes. probably right. Both accounts could be used that way. They're, they are really different and it's much more complicated to set up a special needs trust yes. than to set up a Cal Able account. So you definitely want to talk to someone and get more information, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are at 
time, I just want to okay. encourage anyone to um, share any comments um, in the chat about this training, what you learned, what was helpful, what you still have questions about. We'll keep um, the call open for a few more minutes. So okay. I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much, Dee, for your You're time. You're very welcome. This yeah. is a, a challenging topic for anyone and something that we all need to hear over and over and over. So thank you for sharing You're it. You're very welcome and have everyone have a good have a good day. Rest of the day. Well, thanks everyone yeah. for sticking on with us. Yeah. Thank if you have any questions, you can oh Dee just disappeared, didn't she? <laughs> well, if you have any questions, Cindy can answer them. <laughs> or Cindy can send them to Dee. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, everybody. And please, yeah. if you can, register for, for next week so that we can sh uh, show some love and some support for the self-advocates who are going to be joining us next week, uh, including a couple of parents who are going to share their experience of their family member getting a job. So we hope you'll join us for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh,